Hello? Hmm. Hello? Alright. Last time we made things appear and disappear. And if I'm not mistaken, we like change the color of some things in the font. So like if as the user put their mouse over a uh, certain sentence on the screen, it would get bigger and a different color. Which, you know, if you're doing a tutorial for someone reading or something along those lines, that could be that could be something that's very effective. So we're going to continue on that and sort of explore some more possibilities because really um, the sky's the limit as far as this goes. Um, anything that you can set via HTML attribute or CSS attribute, you can access and change via JavaScript. And you can do more than that even, but for now we're going to focus uh, on that. So what I like to do, and, and, and I'll, I'm going to try this a couple different ways, all right? I'm going to try uh, making a page, uh, a little photo gallery page, whereas um, images, um, as you place your mouse over an image, it gets bigger, all right? We can do this a couple different ways, but we'll try it this way first. So let me go in and start my page. I'm going to use Garamond. You know, Garamond is from like way back, a long time ago. So I'll use it as a tribute to Mr. Garamond. We'll put our standard tags in here. One thing I've noticed that many of you are doing, and it's a good thing, is putting in the little um, Firefox CSS file, which helps older versions of Firefox um, handle some of the HTML5 tags, and also put in the HTML5 shift for Internet Explorer. And that's a good thing, and you should continue to do that. Sometimes in the interest of time, I don't do that. All right, I have four pictures here of, of birds that were actually taken here on campus. And I'm going to make a little photo page for them. And I'm going to style them via CSS. So let me go and put in the HTML first. I will put a section on my page. And I will put my four pictures of birds here on the page. Maybe. Now, there's all sorts of ways that you could organize a photo gallery if you, if you wanted to. I'm going to start off just by doing my basic old HTML for the four images. And we'll take a look at that. Pardon me? Okay. And there's our four images. If you're on campus in the spring, this is actually taken between, on the second floor, between the business building and the college center. There's like a bridge that goes. 
last two years, uh, robins have built their nests there, and I've been following them. I think these are pictures I took when my DSLR were, were still wor was still working. Um, but at any rate, there are pictures. There's the mom sitting on it here shortly after it hatched. There's the, the babies are growing up and starting to crowd each other out. And then finally, an empty nest. I felt so sad. All right. Now, uh, if you notice here, this takes up a lot of space. We might, wanna, we might, want, might want to fix this so that it's a little more concise presented on the screen. And there's a couple of ways that we could do this. So what I'm going to do is by styling, I'm going to try to present so that we can see all four pictures at the same time. So I put them in a section, and to start out, I'm going to style the section. Oops. To say that the section takes up 50% of the screen, let's say. Um, and I'll center it, margin 0px auto. And then I'm going to set each image to have a width of 50%. Um, Actually, we'll make it 45%. We'll leave a little slack in there. Let's see how that looks. All right. So now we got all four images on the same area. I should probably go in and put like a title. So this is more concise to be sure, but the problem is that well, I don't really get as good a look at them. So it would be nice if I could do something like if I put my mouse on it and made it bigger. So we saw similar things last time. We didn't do exactly this, but we made, for example, the font bigger um, when the user put their mouse over something. In, we made things visible and invisible. So we already had a little bit of practice on this. So let's go in and let's write some code here that will say on mouse over equals what is missing now? What am I going to need to add to this image tag besides finish out the on mouse over? What am I going to need to add to this to make this work? An ID, right. I don't absolutely have to, but it's going to go a lot nicer if I do this. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put an ID of this of pick one. And the reason I do that is because that will make it easier for me to point to this guy. Now there's a bunch of different ways you can point to, point to things on the, on the page, on, on the screen. But certainly probably the most straightforward way is to grab it by its ID. Now, in other situations, you can use one of these other ways, but it works pretty good here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say on mouse over equals, and I'm going to say document get element by ID, then in parentheses I'm going to put the ID that I want, pick one, and I'm going to change something about it. What am I going to change about it? I'm going to change the style, and what am I going to set the style equal to? Let's set the style equal to, or I'm sorry, what about the style am I going to change? I'm going to change the width. 
And what should I change the width to? I'm going to change it to 95%. So, on mouse over, document on the web page, get element by ID, find the thing on the page that has an ID of, pick one, the very image. What do I want to do about it, or with it? I want to change the style. What do I want to change the style? What about the style do I want to change? I want to change the width. What do I want to change that to? And it's 95%. So, now when I go and refresh this, if I put my mouse over that, that gets bigger. Problem is, when I take the mouse out, it stays bigger. So, I'm going to have to go in and code an on mouse out event. It's going to look almost exactly like this, except it's going to be a different percentage for the width. I'll say on mouse out, and I'll change the percentage back to 45%. All right. And then I can just as well do this. I can go uh, and, and put this on the other three images. Do a little changing of things around. Change that to a two, 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 three, three, three. This is one's a little tricky, right? The way this one goes, simply because it's positioned right, or the, it's positioned in an awkward place. As soon as it gets bigger, it expands, and um, it, it takes up space, um, or, or it, it, sh it switches position. So maybe this isn't the best thing to do with this. All right, maybe there's something else we can do instead. But from a technical perspective, this this works. All right, we made the we made the images bigger when the user puts their mouse over them. So we saw how that worked. We'd have to decide design-wise, is that something we would want? And I would, you know, I'd say no, which is good because I wanted to do this a different way anyhow. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do take a slightly different approach. Yeah, go ahead. If I wanted to do the same thing to every image, could I have avoided it? Yes, by creating a JavaScript function and calling that JavaScript function in four different places. This is a, and, and that is more valuable when you have several JavaScript statements. This is straightforward enough. It's just a one statement thing that we're doing. This is straightforward enough where I'm not too concerned about that. But when we start getting into longer chunks of JavaScript, maybe we want to do a couple different things when we put our mouse over something. Um, then we might start looking at creating a function for it. And then what you do is you, you essentially group those statements together, and you give them a name. And then you call the function every place you want to do that, and it will take care of it. So. Um, possible we'll talk about functions today. Um, we certainly will touch on them at least before the end of the semester. Let's look at doing this a slightly different way. Let's look at doing this with thumbnails. All right. So this is sort of thumbnails, but 
this is, in this case, the thumbnail, uh, or in this case, I'm loading the full image and I'm just making it bigger and smaller. All right. A true thumbnail is a little different. A, th a true thumbnail is sort of a little version of a picture. So let's go and do this. I'm going to save this as birds2. And I'm actually going to go in and I'm going to make little versions of the pictures. So, I'm going to go and edit this guy. I bring up ye old paint, which I certainly knew how to use at one point in time. Let's make it 20% of its size. Yeah, it's a good size for a thumbnail. I'm going to call it 1T. All right, let's go and make a smaller version of this guy. Now, I think it's a good idea to make sure all your thumbnails are the same size and have the same aspect ratio. When I say aspect ratio, I mean the ratio between the width and the height um, of it. That allows me to put my thumbnails in a nice little sort of grid pattern. and make some look consistent. Now in this case I lucked out because all these images are the same size, so they're the same aspect ratio. But if I have a case where maybe some pictures are portraits and some pictures are landscape, I could easily go and crop it to make each one of them have like a square for a thumbnail. So, I could do this a couple different ways. I could simply, I'm making actually a, a second copy of the picture for the thumbnail. The reason I'm doing that is let's imagine if I had 50 images. If I had 50 images and I was downloading each time someone loads a page, 50 full size images, that would make for a slower download. Instead, I download 50 of the smaller images and as the user puts their mouse over the thumbnail, then they get the bigger copy of the image. In the first example, I did it the other way, where I simply made the full-size image smaller initially and then made it bigger um, as they put their mouse over it. So. These are all 128 pixels wide. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make this section actually I'm going to make a section called thumbnails.
And there's our thumbnails. Somehow, except the first one got messed up. get rid of these JavaScript statements because I think that's what's messing them up. There we go. All right. So we have those four thumbnails. They're all the same size. And again, because they're all the same orientation originally, um, and the same uh, aspect ratio, they line up nice. All right. If we had one that was portrait, I would suggest cropping them to make them consistent. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a bigger picture in the middle. All right. So I'm going to go here and say image. Source equals, and I'm going to start out with it being the one big picture. I'm going to put this in a section called Big Picture. Okay, I do not see why this is I'm not floating these alongside each other. Let's try this. Ah. There we go.
All right, there we go. How can I put some space in between them? I could put a margin. And since I want the margin only on the left, I could say margin left 20 pixels. Now give me a nice little gap here. All right. So notice I started initially with the big thumbnail for the big picture uh, for number one. All right. So picture one is the initial big picture. What I can do, though, is I put my mouse over the thumbnails. I can swap that. Now, here's an interesting thing. It's a little bit different than the examples we went over so far. I'm not going to be changing the style of that tag. I'm going to be changing the SRC attribute, right? Because what determines what gets put in an image? Well, that SRC attribute. Not anything about the style. So this could be a little different. So what I'm going to say is, on mouse over equals document get element by ID oh, better give this guy an ID. big. Now normally in the past examples we've said dot style dot something. Here we're not changing the style. All right. We are instead changing the SRC attribute. So therefore I'm going to say SRC equals one dot JPEG. All right, now I'm going to go in and do that for each of these. So now as I put my mouse over the images, the images change. For the kinds of pictures I have here and the sizes and all that, this is probably a better alternative than the first one I showed. All right. But I did want to show that you have a couple alternatives and you can handle this a few different ways. All right. Questions on any of this? Yeah, if, if, for example, like if you go to LC's page, all right, notice be successful, register early. It went and it shifted into that other banner. Tuition makes college affordable, LCC tuition makes college affordable, since there are pauses for a few minutes, then finally parade of scholars. Now, without actually seeing the code, this could actually be done a few different ways, but it's probably what you described, is there's probably JavaScript on the page that simply has a pause of a certain amount of time and then sets the, the, the image to um, changes the image, transitions the one image in and transitions the other image out. No idea. Let me think about that. You can do some animation via HTML5. So it's possible they did some animation via HTML5. You could also do um, things like this in Flash. I, I, I'm almost positive they did not use Flash 
So my guess would be they either used JavaScript or they used HTML5 animation. But Flash is sort of uh, an old, older style way that Flash has sort of fallen out of favor. Um, and I wouldn't suggest doing anything brand new in Flash. Um, but it could have been done in Flash. What, what was the question? Oh, people stopped using Flash? Yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs effectively killed Flash, I would, I, I would say in my mind, by saying that the iPhone will never, ever, 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 ever support Flash. All right, um, that's, you know, that, that steered away. Now, HTML5 likely would have grown to replace Flash anyhow, but that sort of, um, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, hastened the um, people moving away from Flash. Flash, there, there's a lot of issues with Flash. Um, there, there are possible exploits with that, but there is with, with every technology. Um, Flash tended to be sort of a resource hog. Flash had the problem of it being not really a web standard. Um, which means you got into nasty version problems and, and making sure you had the right plugin installed and, and all that sort of thing. So there, there's a number of issues um, with Flash. But again, keep in mind, you know, it's easy for us to look back and um, question a technology like after the fact, after times have moved on, right? Um, but at the time, that was a way to do things, right? I mean, even like people talk about the Y2K problem, if, if any of you remember that, all right? Um, you know, why would anyone only store two digits for a year? Well, yeah, when your computer had 16K of memory, that was probably a good idea to do, all right? The problem was is that time went on and, and folks didn't adapt and folks didn't see that coming until it was pretty close to the, to the last minute to make, to make the changes of these things. So it's easy for us to, to criticize what's wrong with Flash, but it allowed people to do stuff that they wanted to do when the standards, that is HTML5 uh, and JavaScript uh, and uh, CSS, didn't allow them to do that. So. Well, you have to differentiate between Java and JavaScript, okay? Because Java and JavaScript are two different things. And secondly, I don't say anything to Homeland, Homeland Security except yes, sir, and no, sir. All right, so just as an FYI. Um, but uh, again, uh, I am not aware of that. Um, so I can't really, you know, I don't really have anything to say on that other than to say there is a difference between Java and JavaScript when you're talking about on web pages. This is JavaScript, which is, again, it's sort of, it's one of those pet peeves of mine um, when, when folks talk about, like, web pages with Java. Well, there, is, there are web pages with Java on it, but that's not what we're doing. We're doing JavaScript. Other questions? Now, the nice thing about this is that every technology is doing its job. And it's everything together that makes this work. So, for example, all right, let me save the, another copy of this guy. If I wanted this to be, the thumbnails to be oriented not horizontally like this, or I'm sorry, not vertically like this, but horizontally, I don't have to touch the HTML and I don't have to touch the JavaScript. Each does just their little piece of the puzzle. 
All right. What do I have to change? Well, I have to change the way it looks, therefore CSS. So let's go in and let's change the way that this looks simply by changing a few things here. And off the top of my head, pardon me? Oh. Simply by changing a few things here, I've changed without changing anything in the HTML, anything in the JavaScript, just by changing the CSS. I can get two pages that look different, but essentially act the same. All right? And I could go from there, doing all the CSS sort of tricks that we've done um, in the past. I could center this guy, um, and so on. All right? That's one of the reasons that we talk about JavaScript. Um, even though the aim isn't to make you an expert in JavaScript based on just these uh, few classes that we're going, we're, we're going over, um, it does bring to the party something that the other technologies just don't have. All right? they, they don't have this kind of interaction. All right? um, but you can see how it works. How do I want to say it? It works with the other technologies and what the other technologies provide. So it's a dynamic way of going in and changing um, the way a page looks or the content of the page based on um, some user action. And again, that's what I would that's what I would call interactivity. One other thing that JavaScript is often used for is form validation. We have about five minutes left today and I'd like to if I can find the form validation or the form script uh, that we did form HTML page that we did I'd like to add validation to it. When did we talk about forms is the million dollar question. Week 12? Oh, I am good. Or is it the week before that? Yeah, this one will work. All right. Let's look at this example of the form. All right. Notice with this, we have our form. If I hit search Bing without putting anything in there, Bing doesn't really know what to do with that, right? So it doesn't do anything. And that's kind of awkward. All right. I should do some, you know, if it handles it okay if I put something in here. But if I put nothing in there, then Bing sort of doesn't know what to do. Now, it's good to do as much validation as you can on the client side. Why is that? Because that saves a request going all the way through the internet to a server and then a response coming back saying, I'm sorry, I can't process that. That's what's happening here when I click the button. 
It sends a request to the Bing server. The Bing doesn't really know Bing server doesn't really know what to do with it, so it just displays the search page again. It, it search page. It'd be better if instead we did some validation and we made sure that there was something in the text box before we go and do that. Now, there is an HTML5 element that we can make a form required. All right. And let's take a look at that. near the bottom. I can put an attribute of required here. Now the question of course is, is that going to work? Because that's an HTML5 feature, it may or may not work. Or, it may work in some browsers, but not the others. So I can go in here and I can say required Oh, and looky there. Please fill out that field. Yay. But if I go to another browser Internet Explorer doesn't work. This is what's known as graceful degradation. All right, we talked about that before, and that's kind of a weird sounding uh, phrase, but at least it didn't blow up, in other words. Graceful degradation is where you run something on a browser that doesn't support a feature, and it might not do exactly what you want it to, but at least it doesn't blow up completely. So we have this dilemma as web developers. We got these wonderful HTML5 attributes, but we have some browsers that don't support them. So what do we do? Unfortunately, what we have to do is we have to be like the old guy that wears a belt and suspenders. All right, We have to put in the HTML. If we put in the HTML5 attribute, we have to go in and also code for those people who don't have a browser that supports it. And in this case, that would be with, with JavaScript validation. Let me real quick do this. All right. We'll talk about it a bit today, and then we'll finish it up on Wednesday. See if this works. Let's 
it works, right? Because it's not submitting it to Bing. I'm not displaying an error message, and I can do that pretty quick here. I can say alert. Fill in the form. So I pop up an error message. I actually don't like alerts like that. And next time we'll talk about how we can do a better job with that, but in the interest of time. So it works in Internet Explorer now, the code I wrote. All right. And it works for a browser that is compatible. Essentially, what I did is I put an on submit method, which is when the form is submitted. I look to see if there's any value in that text box. And if there is not a value in that text box, I sort of say, hey, stop the presses. I display an alert that says, fill in the form. That's that message box that uh, pops up. And I return false. And the return false is what tells the browser, hey, don't go and actually submit this. Right? There's, there's some kind of problem in here. We'll go over this in more detail. And you can see here, here is where we're starting to get into where that's kind of confusing code to read in one line. All right. Imagine if you had a form with a dozen required fields. You'd have this essentially repeated a dozen times or so. And that would be really hard to, to read. So one of the things that we could do to maybe make this a little easier to read is put this in a function. So this is where we'll pick up on next time. All right. Questions? All right.